It is great to welcome John Perkins back to the program. He's an activist and also author of the classic book Confessions of an Economic Hitman. More recently, the author of Touching the Jaguar, which is available now. John, great to have you back. It's wonderful to be with you again, David. Thank you. I, I love your show. You do great stuff. So I appreciate being on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, I, I want There's so many things I want to ask you about. One is from your perspective, if coronavirus has served as a sort of way to test the economic system that we have, which you know so much about and have have critiqued in so many interesting ways over the years, what has coronavirus exposed about the underlying reality of our economic system? Well, you know, to answer that, I, I just a little story here that a, a number of years ago, I took a group of people, you know, I take people to the shamans of Latin America on trips. And we were with a lady shaman high in the Andes of Ecuador, a Quechua speaking shaman with the wonderful name of Maria Juana, <laughs> Maria Juana <laughs> Yamberla. And I was translating. Someone asked, hey, Maria Juana, how do we save the earth? And she laughed and she said, you know, the earth isn't in danger, but we are. And a bunch of other species we take with us. And then she pointed up at this huge sacred volcano that lives near her house, that hovers over her house. Sorry, that hovers over her house called Imbabura. And she said, a few years ago, 20 years ago, that, that volcano was covered with a massive ice cap. It isn't anymore. Mother Earth is, is twitching. We're like so many fleas. If we get to be too much of a nuisance, she'll just <laughs> shake us all off. And she's twitching now. She's showing us the, the, the glaciers are melting. And, you know, I thought, I thought, David, over the years, every time there's been a major hurricane or fires in, in Australia and California or whatever, what these once in 100 year events that happened every year or so now, I remembered what Maria Juana said. But, you know, that and, and the, the, they've been sending us a message that, that this death economy doesn't work. We've got to create a new system. But we've we've taken that as a local thing. So if I survive a hurricane, I expect outside the outside world to come to help me bring water, food, et cetera. The coronavirus has taught us that there is no outside world. This is global. Everybody on the planet is being impacted. And we're seeing, you know, pe that people can see stars over over Shanghai <laughs> in Los Angeles these days. It's having a huge impact. We're, all of our lives are changing. We don't like change. Human beings don't really like change, but we've all been forced to change radically. And we, we've, we're coming to understand that maybe some of those changes are, are, are for the better, that, that, that they actually make life more interesting, more fun. So when you worked as uh, a self-described economic hitman, you were able to essentially, I mean, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying profiting from some of the underlying fragility of the system that we have, which a lot of people may not really see as fragile. Do you agree that coronavirus has exposed that even stable seeming economies are actually far more fragile and in a matter of just a couple of weeks can fall apart very quickly? It's absolutely exposed that, and it's also exposed the tremendous inequalities uh, that, that 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 our system is filled with. You know, the the, the racial discrimination, the gender discrimination, all, all this, all these inequalities that are really coming to the surface. So, I think the coronavirus is showing us our our shadow side, and in fact, the way many governments have reacted to it has shown us our our shadow side too, and shown us that the old system isn't working. We don't want to return to normal. We want to create a new a new normal. That's a what we call a life economy. And so can you talk a little bit about as specifically as you want what those changes would be? I mean, one of the fundamental realities of the economy we have is that being proactive is fundamentally not encouraged because proactive just means you're spending money on stuff you might not actually need to spend money on, essentially. Right. You're, you're spending money now for something that may happen, but but it may not. What are the changes that would need to be made in order to, to have what you call a life economy, what some might call a more sort of human centered capitalism or, or some other term that would be applied to it? Well, yeah, David. So a great deal of the book Touching the Jaguar uh, centers around the idea that, that the truth that human reality is molded by human perceptions. I learned that when a shaman saved my life in 1969 deep in the Amazon. But it's also the basis of modern psychotherapy, 
of, of, of quantum physics, of marketing, of advertising, of corporate policy. Uh, our perceptions control our reality. This death economy, what, we, what many economists are referring to as a death economy because it, it's consuming in the short term the resources upon which it depends in the long term. It's exhausting it, and it's destroying the, the environment as we know it. Uh, and it's based on one perception, and that is that businesses have the goal, must have the goal of maximizing short term profits for a few investors, really, regardless of the social and environmental costs. And that's taken us down this very, very dangerous road. So what we really need to change is that perception. We need to touch that Jaguar, and I'm, I'm, I'm touching that Jaguar all the time. It's the Jaguar that, that keeps us locked and, and the fear that, that change is, is dangerous. Uh, and that, you know, we don't, want to, we don't want too much change. But what we need to do is change that goal, that perception of that, and the goal needs to be, instead of maximizing short-term profits, to maximize long-term benefits for humans and and the, the entire and all of nature, the and, planet. And part of that, I mean, that this critique. So, in a, in the business cycle, it's about what was your quarterly profit, what did you do for the year, what was earnings per share. The political system is also based around this, right? In the sense that if members of Congress are up for re-election every two years, if the president's up for re-election every four you're essentially constantly campaigning. And this also at a systemic level encourages what can you justify that you did in the last six months rather than how did you improve the country for the next 20 or 30 years? Right. And that's that's exactly what needs to change. So so let's, you know, encourage businesses to invest, to pay investors to invest in things that clean up pollution. Uh, that regenerate destroyed environments, that recycle, that come up with new technologies. You know, we've gone a long way with wind and solar, but in a way, those are both in their infancy. Let's move beyond that. Let's let's channel the air into forms of energy. There's, there's so much that we can do. And we've learned how to be creative during this coronavirus. And you know, for as an example, uh, uh, over 50% of your tax dollars and mine, if you're an American citizen, uh, go to the military in the discretionary budget. And, and our military is doing some crazy things like building more aircraft carriers and missiles and, and, and things that the, the Russians and Chinese are not focusing on at all. They're focusing on cybernetics and they're focusing on you know, new technologies. I imagine if, if, if some of that money that we're currently paying Raytheon and General Dynamics to use to build these systems that are basically obsolete, instead we put that money to encouraging these companies and entrepreneurs and other companies to mine all the plastic that's floating around in the oceans and, and, and all the oil that's leaked around oil, get gas stations all over the world and, and at oil drilling sites. And there's so much more. There's so many, many things uh, like that that we can pay people to do. We're talking about a full employment economy here when we're talking about a life economy. But we're talking about instead of making those widgets and stuff that you mentioned earlier that people don't really need, and in a way we probably don't even really want, except we're given the impression, hey, if you don't wear this shirt, nobody's going to want to date you. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, there's this impression, there's this perception that's created our reality. We need to create another reality that what we really want to invest in are the things that will make life better for all of us and for future generations. Right. I mean, my framework as I, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to label everything, but I think an ideology that pretty well describes my views would be social democracy, which is that there are areas where I'm fine with the market directing resources as long as the market is well regulated and it's a fair market. And the government, as you say, is saying there are some things that are bigger than profit. So, for example, cleaning up the oceans may not be particularly profitable in the way that we would measure it in the short term, but the long term value of it to humans is such that that should be taken outside of the market forces. Is that more or less the, the ideology you're applying? It is, David. And, and I think we have to look at the definition of what what's successful uh, statistically, the measurement, as you as you pointed out, GDP is a, is a standard measurement tool and it's a lousy one. And mm. I just got that when I was a, an economic hitman that that I, I thought that because I was taught in business school that if you invest a lot of money in infrastructure in, in poor countries, 
that have resources, your corporations want you use those resources as collateral. Uh, that helps everyone because you can show that when you do that, the GDP grows. But I came to see over time that that's really only helping the very wealthy people because GDP is very skewed toward the wealthy. So if you take, for example, the United States with three individuals have as much wealth as half the half the population of our country. If those three individuals made 10 percent return on their investment last year and half the population lost 3 percent, we're still short sure growth of GDP of something a little under 5 percent. So the measuring rods that we're using do not tell us anything about true prosperity in a country. They tell us about the prosperity of the wealthy, the big businesses, and those the people who own those big businesses. And so we really need to change that whole way of, of how we look at what's successful and measure success much more in, in the long term and how it impacts everybody, not just the, the big owners of big businesses. What are some of the metrics you would suggest including? I recently read the uh, Charles Whelan's book, Naked Economics, and there's things I like in it and things I disagree with. But one of the things he talks about is we should at minimum, if we want to evaluate how an economy is doing, we, we can include GDP. We should look at unemployment. We should look at inequality. We should look at poverty. We should look at uh, trade balance, although individually none of these metrics tells us everything we need to know. They can start to paint sort of a picture. Uh, what do you think of those? What would you add? What what would you be looking at? Well, there's, there's so many things along those lines. I mean, we should we, we should be measuring the value of of, of 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 somebody doing housework at home, the, mm. the woman man doing doing housework, taking care of the kids, uh, the value of, of people making music. You know, you're in, in Boston. There's a lot of amazing musicians in all over New England that aren't making a living doing it. They got to make a living doing something else, and then in the evenings they go off and play their music. These this is this is a huge value there. Same as writers, art, artists. Uh, there's so many things. Labor should be should be considered much more valuable than it's considered. Uh, labor of all kinds, our healthcare workers, and on and on and on. There's so many measures. One of the most important ones is that we don't include externality. So when an oil company drills for oil in a country, let's say Ecuador, where I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and it's been a large part of Ecuador's environment's been destroyed by Texaco, now Chevron. Um, that, that, that they don't have to pay for that. That's not included in the price of, of oil that they that they charge. They just dump the waste. They don't have to pay for the cleanups or all the people that suffered. But that's true throughout all the businesses. It's not just the oil companies. There's all these externalities. They should be included in the cost. And when you start including them, you see that the, that other things have a have a great deal more of value. Is that the biggest failing of markets? If you had to pick what it is that, that they really don't, even though efficient market hypothesis folks tell us that markets do account for externalities, that they really don't. And that's where you need government to step in. Yeah, any 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 accountant will tell you that the externalities, many of them are not included at all. Uh, it, 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 you know, the, the, the people that are used. Uh, in sweatshops overseas, or, or now a, a lot of it's by you know the people that answer their telephone calls in other countries. Uh, their health is not paid for; it's not taken into account. If they get sick, they get fired. And, yes, and that's a lousy, that's a terrible system. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that that certainly is a starting point. But I think the most important thing that we all need to understand is that the basis of the system, the the assumption, is based on this perception that you must maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and, and environmental costs. And this means that a CEO is, is actually given the mandate to do whatever it takes to maximize profits. And that may mean destroying the environment, uh, destroying the resources upon which his company depends in the long run in order to make short-run profits, it, exploiting labor, uh, corrupting politicians, and, and now, it means, you know, these companies have learned how to corrupt politicians legally, because as we all know, nobody gets elected to a big public office in the United States without huge amounts of money that basically is generated by corporations one way or another. And and these people are offered incredible high paying jobs as consultants, uh, lobbyists, whatever, when they when they leave politics. Uh, so so we've got this system where where CEOs are, are, are basically forced by the investors by Wall Street, by their owners, to do whatever it takes 
to maximize short-term profits. And that's proven to be insanity. It's taken us down this course that's caused so many problems. When you come right down to it, David, the coronavirus, the racial discrimination, climate change, income inequality, species extinction, those are all problems. But they're not the disease. They're not the, the problem. They're, they're symptoms of, of the disease. And the disease is an economic, it's really a governmental social economic system that we can call a death economy that just plain isn't working anymore. It, it had worked. It, it gave us amazing science and medicine and art and so many things. But it's reached its limits. Its time is over. It's time to move into a, a new uh, system, a, a life economy. The book is Touching the Jaguar, now available. We've been speaking with the book's author, John Perkins. John, always great having you on. I so appreciate your time. Thank you so much, David. And I, I would just like to point out that the subtitle of the book is Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World. And, yes. and in the book, there's a, there's a whole process that people can go through on a daily basis or a weekly basis for about 10 minutes that guide each individual, whether you're a carpenter or a plumber or a radio show host or a writer like me, that'll take you down this course to transform your life and, 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 and the world.